I'm Nikki Strong, and this is VOA One, The Hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. On today's program, you will hear reports from Mario Ritter Jr., Andrew Smith, Gregory Stockel, and Gina Bennett. Later, John Russell presents a new everyday grammar lesson. He looks at prefixes that are used for very large numbers. But first, Mario Ritter Jr. has this report. A court in Hong Kong found 14 pro-democracy activists guilty of crimes linked to an unofficial vote in 2020. Some could face life in prison. Hong Kong officials said the action was part of a plot to hurt the government and subvert state power. The main crime was termed conspiracy to commit subversion. The ruling ends a four-year legal case that has gained international attention. Among those convicted was 27-year-old Owen Chow, a democracy activist who has spent most of the last four years in prison. Chow told the court that he considered withdrawing from the election after studying the security laws put in place by the government in Beijing in 2020. But he said he could not leave the masses. In their judgment Thursday, the judges said they had no doubt that Chow's purpose for taking part in the election was to undermine, destroy, or overthrow the existing political system. A former nursing student, Chow started his activism during mass protests over a disputed piece of legislation in 2019. In a separate trial, a court sentenced Chow to five years in prison for temporarily occupying Hong Kong's legislature during the protests. Chow told Reuters that all he had done was to fight for democratic freedoms legally guaranteed under Hong Kong's law since 1997. That year, Britain handed over the territory to China. Democracy is the future of Hong Kong. This won't change regardless of those in power, Chow said in a room at a high-security prison. Chow spoke to Reuters in 2021 before he was arrested. He said he decided to become a health care worker after his father died. Since then, I wanted to take care of others, he said. But he suspended his studies to run in the primary election named in the court case. Chow became interested in activism when huge pro-democracy protests started in Hong Kong. He voiced opposition to quieter plans from older democracy supporters. Chow was one of nearly 3,000 people who faced charges for offenses related to the 2019 protests. More than 290 people faced national security charges. Chow and others were denied a jury trial, although Hong Kong common law permits them. 32 people have spent over 1,000 days in jail without bail. Bail is a process that secures a person's release from prison 
while they await trial. In March, Hong Kong's government said in a statement that all defendants have the right to a fair trial by an independent judiciary. It rejected U.S. criticism of Hong Kong's additional national security measures. Chow said he has tried to remain healthy and strong in prison through exercise, meditation, and study. He reads six books each month, including works on politics, philosophy, and Buddhism. Chow said prison life is difficult, but he tried to take the difficulties in a balanced way or in stride. If we accept that adversity is inevitable and treat adversity as a rare chance to train ourselves, to improve ourselves, we can all take things in our stride, he said. In 2021, Chow met a reporter named Amanda. She told Reuters that the two have a relationship. She is now based in Britain. Chow is now mainly in a one-man prison cell in Stanley Prison. He likely faces another long prison sentence but he said he is considering what is best over the long term. It's a sacrifice for Hong Kong. It's as if I'm sitting in jail for everyone else and suffering on behalf of others. But he added, What I've gained is more than I've lost. I'm Mario Ritter, Jr., A low-cost drug mixture is harming young people in the West African country of Sierra Leone. The mixture is called Kush. Sierra Leone's president, Julius Madabio, declared a state of emergency in April over Kush. The drug is made by combining other powerful drugs like cannabis, fentanyl, and tramadol. Sierra Leone has limited health services. As a result, one community has set up what it calls a treatment center that volunteers operate. They sometimes use extreme measures to cut people's dependence on drugs. The Bombay community operates in the Bombay neighborhood of the capital of Freetown. Recently, the group tried to end the Kush dependence of a co-worker's younger brother. After they failed to persuade him to stop, they locked him in his room for two months. After that, he returned to the university he had been attending. He thanked the group for setting him free. 21-year-old Christian Johnson described his experience. He said, The only time I left the room was when I went to the bathroom. Later, the volunteer group expanded its efforts and took over an unused building. They seized people at the request of their families. Sometimes they chain them up to prevent them from escaping. The country's only mental health hospital formally used similar methods. Suleiman Touré is a local football coach who helped launch the center. He said, We turn parents away for lack of space. The people in the community help. He said, Some bring food. Some bring water, doing whatever they can to help. A doctor in the community visits from time to time. Police said they did not know about the project or the method of chaining people up. 
So far, volunteers say the Bombay community has treated 70 to 80 people. One volunteer showed the chains used in extreme cases to the Associated Press, or AP. No one was chained up at the time. The youngest person held by the group was a 13-year-old boy sent there by his father. I was very angry, and I wanted to have nothing to do with him, said the father, Jabrila Bengura, a college professor. I am very grateful to these men and women for their role in helping my son. This year, President Bio declared war on Kush. He called its use an epidemic and a national threat. He is leading a government effort to treat drug users and prevent its spread. He has promised to do this using law enforcement officials and community activism. People rarely know what they are getting when they buy Kush. Besides powerful drugs, the drug might contain chemicals like formaldehyde. In some communities, officials say people are digging up dead bodies to use the bones to mix with the drug. They are trying to get the chemicals that are used to preserve dead bodies. Daphne Moffitt is the director of the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Sierra Leone. She said the drug is difficult to deal with because so many different substances are used to make it. She said in an email to AP, Before appropriate interventions can be developed, we need to know what materials are in Kush. Ansu Kana is the Director of Mental Health at the Ministry of Social Welfare. He said there has been a large increase in people addicted to Kush arriving at Sierra Leone's only mental health hospital since 2022. However, the government does not publish an official number of deaths linked to Kush or the number of people admitted to hospitals because of it. The Social Linkages for Youth Development and Child Link, or SLYDCL, is a nonprofit group in Sierra Leone that aims to fight drug use. The organization has pushed the government for years to put more resources into fighting addiction. Ephraim McCauley works to educate people about Kush. He first used the drug in college. He found he could get a day's supply for less than $1. He said overcoming the addiction wasn't easy. It was one of the hardest steps of my life. Habib Kamara is the executive director at SLYDCL. He said the availability of Kush grew after suppliers began to produce it locally. He said law enforcement officials need to do more to target top-level producers instead of going after buyers and low-level sellers. The government has said it wants to help, not punish, those who use the drug. Kamara said, if we cannot have an approach that reduces usage, in the future we will not have people to replace us tomorrow in the workforce. I'm Gina Bennett. And I'm Gregory Stockel. In the American state of California, researchers recently climbed the world's largest tree to check on its health. The tree is a giant sequoia named General Sherman. The climbers had good news to report when they returned to the ground. 
The General Sherman tree is doing fine right now, said Anthony Ambrose. He is executive director of the Ancient Forest Society and led the team of researchers. They were looking for damage to the 2,200-year-old tree and possible evidence of a growing threat to giant sequoias, bark beetles. The insects are native to California. No one had ever climbed the famous 85-meter sequoia tree before the researchers. But tourists from around the world come to Sequoia National Park to see the General Sherman and others of its kind. Giant sequoias are the largest trees on Earth. They have survived for thousands of years in California's western Sierra Nevada mountains, the only place where the tree is native. Hot and dry weather and wildfires have threatened the trees in recent years. In 2020 and 2021, record-setting wildfires killed as much as 20% of the world's 75,000 mature sequoias, park officials say. Ben Blome is director of stewardship and restoration at Save the Redwoods League. The most significant threat to giant sequoias is climate-driven wildfires, he said. But we certainly don't want to be caught by surprise by a new threat, which is why we're studying these beetles now, he added. Researchers are growing more worried about bark beetles. The insects were not a serious threat in the past. They lived alongside sequoias for thousands of years. However, park officials say recent bark beetle attacks have killed about 40 sequoia trees, mostly within the national parks. Ambrose said researchers believe dry weather and fires make the trees weaker and less able to survive attacks. The insects dig holes in the highest parts of the tree. Then they move down the trunk, destroying it as they go. The beetles are extremely small in size, but large in number. Working together, they can kill a tree within six months. That is why park officials permitted Ambrose and his team to climb General Sherman. The experts looked for the extremely small holes that the bark beetle makes. They reported no sign of the insects. But it is not possible to climb every sequoia tree and look at its highest part. So, scientists are considering other ways to check the trees, such as the use of drones and satellite imagery. The technology might be able to record and measure beetle activity over large areas of forest. The health check of General Sherman was organized by the Giant Sequoia Lands Coalition, a group of government agencies, native tribes, and environmental groups. They hope to establish a health check program for the tall trees. If they discover beetle infestations, officials say, they could try to fight the attacks with water or chemical treatments. They can also remove individual branches of affected trees. Bark beetles have severely damaged some forests in the western United States in recent years. But they did not threaten giant sequoias until recently. Clay Jordan, 
is superintendent for Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Parks. He said the Sequoias have really withstood insect attacks for a lot of years. So why now? Why are we seeing this change? He added that researchers need to learn more to make sure they can protect the trees. The Sequoia General Sherman is named for William Tecumseh Sherman. The famous military leader helped lead Union forces to victory in the American Civil War. I'm Andrew Smith. What do news stories about space travel, technology, or energy production have in common? Well, one way to answer this question is to look at special prefixes that are often used with measurements in science and industry. These prefixes are especially important to people studying in the STEM fields of science, technology, engineering, and math. Let's start with some important terms and ideas. Prefixes are additions to the beginnings of words. When we add a prefix to a word, it changes the meaning of the existing word, and the result is a new word. Let's take an example to clarify the point. We have the prefix un, meaning not. Then we have the full word happy. When we add the prefix un to the beginning of the word happy, we get the word unhappy. There are many kinds of prefixes. For today's lesson, we will pay attention to one kind of prefix. Prefixes related to large amounts. The National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST, is a U.S. government agency that works on measurement science. NIST has a public list of prefixes used for amounts, or quantities, and their meanings. The list is long, but there are only a few of these prefixes that are important for everyday uses in the sciences and industry. The prefixes that mean 1,000, 1 million, 1 billion, and 1 trillion are useful to know for most kinds of science, energy, and technology stories. Here is how NIST defines these prefixes. Kilo means thousand. Mega means million. Giga means billion. Terra means trillion. In science and industry, we often use large number prefixes to express measurements of distance, energy, or weight. An example of a distance measurement is a meter. An example of a power measurement is a watt. Let's take an example that everyone knows. One kilometer. We have the prefix kilo, meaning 1,000, and the unit of distance, a meter. Let's listen to how Brian Lynn uses the term kilometer in a recent science story on our website. NASA estimates the moon sits an average of about 382,500 kilometers from Earth. The exact distance changes because of the moon's orbit around Earth. The average distance from Earth to Mars is 225 million kilometers. Our example shows an important point about agreement. Note that in our example, 
we make the measurement of distance plural. We add an S to the end of kilometer, and so we get the term kilometers. So, we say one kilometer, two kilometers, and three hundred thousand kilometers. The idea is that the prefix changes the meaning of the word, but the word must still agree in terms of being singular or plural. So, do not forget about the plural markers we use at the ends of words. We can carry this same idea to an energy story. A watt is a unit of power. When we use prefixes to change the meaning, we arrive at a term such as a megawatt, meaning a million watts, or a gigawatt, meaning a billion watts. Let's listen to part of a recent report about wind energy development in 2023. The Global Wind Report, published recently by the Global Wind Energy Council, or GWEC, a trade group, said the world developed 117 gigawatts of new wind power capacity, a 50% increase from 2022. Note that in our example, the power capacity measurement is expressed in gigawatts. Once again, we add the S ending to gigawatt because it is plural. 117 gigawatts. Let's take some time to work with these ideas. Imagine you want to describe the amount of data that a hard drive can hold. Use the prefix tera and the unit of computer information, a byte, to describe the storage capacity of the hard drive. Pause the audio to consider your answer. Here is one possible answer. This hard drive has one terabyte of data storage capacity. Here is another possible answer. This hard drive has two terabytes of data storage capacity. We will end this everyday grammar with a call to action. Write us a short description of something related to science, energy, or technology. Be sure to use prefixes such as kilo, mega, giga, or tera. Try to connect your description to something related to your country or your life. You can write us your answers in an email to learningenglish at voanews.com. In a future Everyday Grammar, we will give feedback on some of the messages we receive. I'm John Russell. You just heard this week's Everyday Grammar Lesson with John Russell. John joins me now to talk more about the topic. Hi, John. Welcome. Hi, Ashley. Thanks for having me on the show. Your lesson explored prefixes that suggest large numbers. I was wondering, are there also prefixes that suggest very small numbers? Absolutely. NIST, the U.S. government agency mentioned in the lesson, keeps a list of prefixes that suggest very small numbers. Examples include micro, nano, and pico. We might have to explore those prefixes in a future lesson. Have more prefixes been added over time? Yes, absolutely. As science and technology improves, we are able to measure far larger and far smaller quantities. It makes you wonder if even more prefixes will be added in the coming years. Who knows what the future will bring? Exactly. Well, thanks again for coming on the show today, John. Thanks for having me. See you next time. And that's our program for today. 
Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories from around the world.